Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stanford University neuroscientist Carl Dyseroth. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carl Dyseroth. I'm a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist at Stanford. And uh, I think from what Justin just showed you and everything that you've uh, probably seen and heard, neuroscience is uh, among the most exciting challenges and opportunities that we face today. And we use light as a tool uh, in multiple different ways. If you can imagine, though, the complexity of the human brain, it's staggering. More than 80 billion neurons. Each one may have more than 1,000 separate connections. The neurons are small, fragile, intertwined, not organized in a way that we'd like. But as challenging as this is, we start to make headway in animal models. And you know, I can sh tell you now, and I'll show you examples of this, that we can do things uh, that we could not have imagined 10 years ago. We can, for example, Take a look at this brain, and we can say, well, this is a, an incredibly complex uh, device, uh, but it ha might have a logic to it. It actually might have a, a motif that's like the double helix, for example, that even though it's a very simple uh, structural uh, element, it has an immense amount of explanatory power uh, across all of biology for the genetic code, for heredity, for evolution, for growth, for cancer and goes on and on, and what we're seeing now in neuroscience is a similar uh, wave looking for these sorts of motifs that might have explanatory power for how the brain works. The program uh, that we're working with uh, uh, with DARPA is called NeuroFast, and sometimes it's hard to tell if we're uh, riding the wave or part of the wave, giving rise to the wave, but no matter what, it's definitely one of those situations where we run to work uh, each day. Some of the roots, though, of all this are incredibly humble and small in origin. We've heard some of the excitement that's coming from uh, studying microbial organisms, uh, archaeobacteria, for example. These actually are some of our allies in understanding the brain. And how does that happen? Well, both of these organisms, the one on the left, the single-celled green algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardii, and the one on the right, it's an ancient uh, form of bacteria, archaeobacterium, uh, called Natronomonas ferionis. These both make light-activated regulators of uh, electrical uh, current, uh, single proteins that receive photons and move ions across cell membranes. They, of course, do this uh, for their own reasons, but electricity is uh, fundamental to how the nervous system works, and so we can take these proteins and others like them, and now you're looking at the proteins themselves. The one on the left is called a channel rhodopsin. The one on the left is called a halo rhodopsin. They fit into a large category of proteins that are called microbial opsins. And they're amazing molecular machines. We're starting to understand the mechanisms by which they work. But the key point is that they're single proteins, all in one, detectors of light, and they transduce that directly within themselves into ion flow. The one on the left moves positive ions, uh, particularly sodium ions, into the cell, and that ends up being a positive stimulus. It triggers neural firing. The one on the right moves anions, particularly chloride, into the cell, and this turns out to shut down neurons. And so and they respond to different colors of light. We have many more of these. We've engineered them to have all kinds of different ion flow and uh, 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 kinetics, and, and uh, there's an incredible diversity that we've been able to leverage and also uh, create. And because they're single genes, we can use tricks to put them into neurons. This is a neuron uh, in which one of these microbial opsins coupled to a fluorescent protein, so we can see where it is in the cell. Uh, is, is being shown to you, and uh, these opsins, we use molecular tricks to help them go where we want in the cell. And now when you flash light onto this neuron, uh, depending on which one it's got, it's going to fire an action potential, a millisecond long uh, uh, pulse of electricity uh, that actually represents uh, a particular kind of information in the brain. Now this uh, is uh, of course just the molecular and cellular detail. How do we translate this up to the behaving organism. What we do is actually put these genes that encode these proteins, and we put them into viruses. We inject those viruses into the brains of experimental animals. And then we use uh, optical interfaces, like the fiber optic shown here, uh, to come in and deliver precise light patterns uh, in animals that are behaving freely. And this happens to be a rat that was uh, Parkinsonian, and we were studying some of the a uh, aspects by which Parkinsonian uh, behaviors can be uh, elicited uh, uh, or suppressed. And this has turned out, however, to be uh, incredibly uh, uh, diverse 
in terms of the uh, possibilities. What you're seeing here is a measure of anxiety that we're controlling with optogenetics, as this technology is now called. The uh, animal spending most of its time in the more vertical arm of this apparatus, the so-called closed arm. It has elevated walls, and the mouse feels much more safe there, we think. It certainly prefers to spend its time there, and it never goes out onto the more horizontal arm that ha has no uh, uh, walls and is much more exposed. It's like walking the plank to the mouse, and it's avoiding that. That's anxiety in the absence of immediate threat. Now, when we turn on those light with those blue letters that you see there, we're turning on an anti-anxiety pathway deep in the brain. And for the first time, the animal's willing to go out into the open arms. It also continues to explore the closed arms, so it's not as if it's become a, a risk-seeking animal. Uh, but nothing else about its behavior changes. The speed is the same. It simply is willing to include the open arms, the exposed arms, in its uh, exploration. And as soon as we turn off the light, the animal immediately reverts back to how it was before. So this is not uh, something that could have been imaginable uh, uh, certainly 10 years ago. But we can do this sort of thing routinely now, not just with anxiety, but we can uh, turn up or down by reaching in and controlling specific connections, motivation, social behavior, uh, 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 anxiety and depression-related behaviors, uh, affect memory. And this, uh, for us, is a, a level of precision that we hadn't dreamed of before. It's something that uh, we've been excited to be part of building and something that we're applying now uh, together with a host of other technologies to understand aspects of brain function. For example, with this program, we're now playing in very complex patterns of light. We're using spatial light modulators that effectively make uh, holograms. And we can play those in in two or three dimensions, as these uh, spots of light are showing you here with the goal of controlling multiple uh, independently identified and asynchronous neurons uh, within a particular volume. And this, uh, as you might imagine, is technologically complex, requires bringing advanced laser technology, advanced liquid crystal uh, technology, uh, all together in the complex realm of a living, uh, uh, behaving brain. And making headway on this has been exciting. Of course, you might ask, what patterns do you play in? Well, we can guess, or we can go in and directly observe. This is another aspect of the, of the program. This is a mouse that's on a ball. Its head is fixed. It lets us do our imaging. But it's got a virtual reality uh, uh, projection in front of it. And based on how it runs or stops, it moves or doesn't through the virtual reality. And we can show different contexts to the animal in this virtual reality. While all this is going on, you can see on the right these uh, green blobs, the uh, host of little green blobs like stars in the sky. Those are individual neurons. And as they change their fluorescence, that's reporting to us what those neurons are doing, their activity patterns. And we can see when the animal is running through a context, waiting till it comes to a context where it's learned that it can stop and lick for a water reward at this little spout. And you'll see that start to happen in a moment. It's going to stop. And then you can see the pattern of activity among the neurons appearing. So we're seeing all of this in real time during a behavior that we know matters to the animal. And we're seeing with multiple single cell resolution the patterns of activity. This is new work. Uh, it's something that, uh, as you can imagine, will help to guide us in deciding which patterns of activity we'll play in and which we want to modify to understand causally what pattern of activity underlies uh, behavior, in this case, even of memory, because this is a brain structure called the hippocampus that is very heavily involved in memory. And you'll need to use this to understand where you are in a context. Now, this as a image that shows uh, we're not content to stop uh, with the rodents, although we can learn an immense amount. A uh, key part of this program, and we do this in collaboration with Krishna Shinoy at Stanford, is we're trying to translate these technologies uh, to the primate, uh, both the non-human, actually, and aspects of these technologies to uh, human brain tissue. Uh, this work uh, is, uh, again, as you might imagine, is another step in complexity. But uh, what you see here is an interface that's uh, uh, allowing us to gain this kind of optical access to uh, the behaving uh, 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 monkey brain as well. But we actually, there, there's a course uh, of action in surgeries where you can take out part of a, a, a human uh, brain. And this happens uh, under very carefully controlled conditions, uh, consented patients, and so on. And, and part of that, we can take some of that living brain tissue that was no longer needed uh, by the patient. And we can now do the same sort of imaging with this living brain tissue, carrying out this uh, uh, volumetric assessment of multiple single cells. And we can see in this living human brain tissue these dynamical patterns and motifs appearing. Coming back to the image of the double helix, what we're doing now is looking for ex uh, motifs that uh, recur that uh, may have explanatory power for understanding uh, how cortex works. In fact, we can start to see that some of these uh, motifs change depending on 
the precise uh, state of the tissue. Here are two of these human uh, cortical tissues, uh, one on the left in the uh, resting state, the one on the right after we've added a modulator, a chemical modulator of neurotransmitter function that will affect, uh, we, we know in people, uh, alertness and arousal and cognition. And we can see changes in the volumetric activity patterns in these, uh, uh, even in these uh, uh, isolated pieces of human brain. And that gives us a handle to look for what might be meaningful or causal in the terms of important neural properties like attention and arousal. As you might imagine, it's pretty exciting uh, to be involved with this sort of thing. But one thing you might ask is, I can see all these spots of light, and it's great you can see them, and it's great you can control them. But uh, what's the logic of their wiring? How are they connected? That's going to be the key final step that you'll need to really understand it. If you don't understand how they're connected, uh, there's going to be a fundamental barrier there. Now, that's extremely difficult. Uh, the brain is uh, uh, a very challenging uh, object structurally. Uh, it scatters light heavily, and so you can't just look through it. It's not transparent. You have to cut it up into extremely thin pieces in order to see anything at all. And this had been a huge challenge, but we've, what we've been able to do recently is find a way to keep it completely intact and uh, create a situation where we can look uh, into it. And this is a piece of uh, uh, brain that we've made transparent uh, using this uh, method that we call clarity. The green uh, is individual uh, uh, neurons, long-range projection neurons that go from one part of the brain to another. And this is not a, a reconstruction. This actually uh, is an intact piece of brain that we're actually able to look through now. And you can effectively fly around inside it, uh, uh, follow uh, cells that are of interest. Here we're flying in over the hippocampus, the structure that's involved in memory and mood, uh, flying over the cells. And now we're going to look up toward cortex, the surface part of the brain. A big question has been, how do these two parts of the brain interact, for example, in questions relating to memory? How does the top part of the brain, the cortex that we think involves higher function, executive function, uh, a guided uh, behavior that's uh, among the most complex uh, and advanced that human beings have, how does it access and communicate with this deeper structure, the hippocampus that's so involved in memory? Having this sort of structural information is incredibly valuable to us. But how did we do this? How did we get to this point of seeing the transparent uh, brain, making the brain transparent and seeing its wiring? Many organisms have gone to great lengths to try to become transparent over millions of years of evolution. Uh, some have gone so far as to abandon hemoglobin, abandon red blood cells, this uh, cornerstone of the vertebrate lifestyle. But one part of the body that seems difficult to make transparent, no matter how hard you try, even if you give up blood, you can't make your brain, your central nervous system, completely transparent. This is the scattering uh, issue uh, that I mentioned before. And this is due to the refractive index changes uh, that are associated with lipid water uh, interfaces that, of course, uh, are essential to brain's function as an as a electrical uh, device. But uh, we can do this after life. This is a mouse brain before and after the clarity procedure. Uh, we can read text through it. That's not so useful, uh, but interesting. More useful is actually going then uh, in, and a key feature of the clarity method is we can not only see through the brain, but we can label the brain, and labels that were already there remain stable, but we can add in new labels as well. Uh, we can see what kind of cells are there. Is it a dopamine neuron? Is it a serotonin neuron? How do those neurons connect without doing this thin uh, sectioning? We can assess joint statistics across the brain, local and global uh, wiring. And in some ways, we, we, it's, uh, we can go across scales. It's a little like the, the Google Earth type thing. Uh, we can stay at the broad uh, brain-wide scale. And in that very same brain, we can zoom in to very high levels of resolution, even down uh, to the level of single spines on single dendrites. The bumpy little structures on the central tendril are the spines where we think single synapses, single connections from one neuron to another are present. And the fundamental mysteries of the brain remain, uh, of course. Uh, we don't know what scale is most meaningful, where the structural motifs might be. We talked about dynamical motifs before. What about structural motifs? We don't know where the most meaningful ones will be, but at least we can look across scales now in the same preparation. And this is an example of that our, our recent work where we've been able to not just look at the wiring, but define cells, label them in incredibly refined ways. What you're looking at here is an input-output map for one part of the brain. It's called the substantia nigra pars compacta, the dopamine neurons there that are so important in mood. What we're looking at here, and we use some tricks to do this, but we're looking at all the neurons that project to 
those neurons that project to another part of the brain. So all the neurons that project to point A, that in turn project to point B. We can use genetic tricks to create this kind of refined labeling of cells that's very generalizable, and then we can look across the entire brain in a very uh, global and unbiased way and, and, and ask, what are those cells defined that way? Who are they? Where do they live? What's their local and global wiring? And we're working on ways of registering these structural data sets, which can be carried out in the very same animal where we'll have done previously imaging of the activity and controlling the activity during behavior. So we can know, oh, that cell which did this and was important for that, this is its wiring, this is its local and global wiring and its phenotype. So that's the opportunity. That's mouse tissue. Of course, clarity uh, as something that's done uh, after life is easy to do uh, uh, in principle in human tissue, and we've done that in a number of different settings. Uh, human tissue is uh, uh, very uh, uh, dense and, and uh, uh, particularly adult human tissue, tissue takes a little longer to make uh, clear in the clarity procedure, but we can do it. This is neurofilament staining in a human uh, brain tissue. Uh, but of course now we've got uh, big numbers that we're talking about. The human brain is very uh, complex. We have uh, some estimates of the sorts of information we're talking about, even just uh, structurally. If you break the brain into about 300 pieces that fit well into uh, current uh, uh, microscopes, and you think about just one of those cuboids at low resolution, you're definitely talking about a number of terabytes of data. Uh, if you look across the brain that, uh, at low resolution, you've got about a petabyte. But if you want high resolution, so you can actually see axons and wiring, one of those cuboids might be about 200 terabytes. But as you go for the whole brain, that's one brain, you're up to 64 petabytes. And that's just one brain. We want to look at many brains, and we want to compare them, see what makes them different. And of course, uh, that's not just us. There's many labs. And so now we're really talking some data, right? We were, we were worrying about a couple petabytes before, uh, back in 2013 in the lab. Now we're worrying about hundreds of petabytes. And this, as you've heard, is comparable to some of the astronomical, literally, data sets that people are talking about, uh, uh, hundreds of petabytes. And so this is where neuroscience is. A lot of neuroscientists, if you think back to where the roots of this uh, all, all this come from. Uh, it's not in people who uh, have experience in dealing with uh, very large data sets, and this is one of the most refreshing and exciting things about a conference like this, is bringing people together who can uh, share uh, their concepts and ideas and experience across a broad range. And now many people are doing, for example, the Clarity Procedure. We run little uh, workshops where people can come and learn how to do it, and then they go and send us back uh, pictures of how they're doing. Uh, this is a group from King's College London and their uh, data. Um, so I want to tell you one final story in the last minute or so, which is how we're actually using some of these integrative wiring and activity data sets to understand aspects of um, memory storage and memory representation in the brain. And what's on the left here is, some, is a hippocampus, this part of the brain that's involved in memory I've mentioned a few times. And the neurons that are labeled in green, we've put in one of these fluorescent molecules that changes fluorescence when the cell is active. And we can come in and look while the animal's alive at the fluorescence of those cells, and uh, we can actually see that change with, in real time. And what we found is that there's, during learning, there's a particular kind of neuron that appears that's highly correlated in its activity with its nearby cells. These uh, uh, we call hub neurons. And what's shown on the left is uh, two kinds of context. We can put the animal in a fear context or a neutral context. Neutral is where you start. It's an animal before ever having been conditioned. And what you see is the correlation structure of the neurons in the brain. Uh, each individual neuron uh, has a certain probability of being, have its activity correlated with nearby cells, and it tends to fall into a normal distribution. And it doesn't matter if you've trained the animal to be afraid of a particular context or not, that correlation structure stays the same in the neutral context. But in the fear context, where the animal did get a mildly aversive stimulus, that changes the correlation structure. You can see before, on day one, before the training, it was the same sort of uh, a correlation structure. Day two, during training, it starts to shift. Day three, when it's been trained to fear this context, and it's in that context, all of a sudden we can see, using this uh, activity imaging, that there's a very different correlation structure. And some cells are very highly correlated in a very interesting way. And one thing we found very recently in the lab uh, with the support of this program is we've been able to find a top-down connection from the surface part of the brain, the cortex, to the hippocampus that's like a pointer to these cells that seems to recruit these highly correlated cells that are associated with memory formation. And so 
We, may, we certainly don't understand everything about memory formation, but we've now found uh, a top-down pointer to those cells. And if you look in the middle, that's a representation of some of the cells in the uh, red circles that we found are recruited by this uh, top-down uh, projection. Uh, and this can be done during freely moving uh, animal behavior. Um, what you're seeing here is baseline activity. And then when the red asterisk comes on, that's when we start driving this top-down connection, this pointer to the hippocampus. And within the red circles, we see this new population of cells that wasn't active before start to turn on. And these are the highly correlated cells. We're starting to use methods like clarity to understand their properties, who they are. And of course, all this is done in the freely moving uh, animal. So this is uh, the opportunity of the program to start to bring some of these tools together. Uh, you know, if you plot the temporal precision and the number of neurons, there have historically been uh, trade-offs. As you've gone faster, you've been limited uh, in terms of the number of neurons, number of neurons you can study. Uh, but we're starting to push that limit up, uh, and other uh, programs uh, associated with, uh, uh, with, with DARPA and the Brain Initiative are pushing this uh, further as well. Using some of the more modern spatialite modulator technologies, we're getting uh, certainly into the dozens of neurons and, and maintaining this uh, single action potential resolution, the fundamental currency of information flow in the brain. But there's a long way to go, and uh, uh, this is the kind of thing where we'll need to bring much more insight technological uh, expertise from across uh, uh, what we see here, for example, represented in this room. So that's what we're working on. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, again, why it's so exciting uh, to come to work. And uh, I want to share uh, my deepest thanks to everybody in the lab who's worked on this and uh, to thank you also for your time. Thank you, Carl. So we have a number of questions already coming in online, and I'm just going to jump right into that to get us started. One of them has to do with the fact that you mentioned you're working with genes from Archaebacteria to do some of this work on sort of the most complex human organ we could imagine. And what does that say about the value of seemingly obscure basic research on organisms like Archaebacteria? Well, that's a great question. It's actually one of my uh, favorite topics, and uh, I've written about this and spoken about this. but. Uh, none of what, what we do uh, on that front, on the optogenetics front, would have been possible without many decades of foundational work uh, by pure basic scientists studying membranes, studying algae, uh, uh, studying things without even thinking about uh, neuroscience, psychiatry, or anything else. And so I think uh, that's a very deep lesson there that we have to keep in mind. Hmm. Mic number two. Hi. I'm Don Wunsch with Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri, 100 miles from here. And uh, I was curious, you talked a little bit about scaling up from mouse to primate and even human. Uh, I'm very interested in the possibility of scaling down to insect level. There are certainly many interesting phenomena and, and it would uh, open up, I, I think you can already buy these genetically engineered mice. If you could buy bugs, that could be very interesting as well. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm totally on board with scaling down. Uh, there's a long and glorious history of that in, in neuroscience and biology, as you know, and it's already being done with uh, optogenetics. Uh, in fact, it was done early on. Uh, we and others have done experiments in uh, worms uh, and flies. Uh, it uh, has uh, uh, no particular limit uh, in terms of the scale, and there's a certain opportunity there. If you, for example, in some of these very small organisms, even vertebrates like the zebrafish, uh, which it's a vertebrate brain, has many of the same structures, scaled down, many fewer neurons, there's a huge opportunity there to start with something that has, we think, all the fundamental parts, but many, few, many fewer components, and maybe that's one of the best places to start doing the foundational work, looking for motifs that might be of interest then you'd know what to look for at these larger uh, scales. And I think that's uh, absolutely the case. And we have a significant zebrafish effort in my lab for that very reason. Well, the, the interface would be much more challenging as you got smaller. But for example, Drosophila, one of the most widely studied animals ever. And so even if, uh, even if you had to accept huge limits as to how much you could observe there still might be pretty big advantages, even if you can only, uh, even if you accept uh, a, a much smaller uh, amount of information that you can extract from each brain, but just to be able to correlate with other studies. Yeah, I, I completely agree. 
Another question from Twitter, how deep into the brain can optogenetic stimulation go, and how do you get overlapping structures out of the way? How deep can you go? Uh, so light scatters in the living brain, uh, but with the fiber optic uh, interface, uh, we can go as deep as we want. We can go anywhere in the brain. Uh, so that's the simple answer. Of course, uh, uh, you know, even back in 2007, we were showing that uh, uh, we could get optogenetic control even through an intact skull, but there's an advantage to bringing in the fiber optic because that gives you spatial resolution. You're starting your stimulus at a particular defined deep spot. So we uh, prefer to stick with that uh, fiber optic interface. And uh, then, you know, that it, of course, fiber optics, they're thin, but they can penetrate uh, into the brain. They'll damage what they go through, but they're actually relatively much thinner than electrodes that are used even in human beings for deep brain stimulation, for example, uh, which are tolerated quite well. What progress has occurred in using optogenetic techniques for understanding glial cell function? You might want to explain what glial cells are. Yeah. Well, I've talked a lot about neurons, but there's a, those are the cells that are connected with synapses and fire action potentials. But there's a, a few other kinds of cell in the brain, and one of them is called a glial cell. That comes from the word for glue. They don't fire action potentials, but they uh, do a lot of very complex tasks. And they may be, who knows, they could be as important or more important for uh, advanced functioning uh, uh, compared with other cell types. Now, because they don't fire action potentials, you might think they're not as susceptible to this sort of electrical control with light. But in fact, we and others have been able to uh, control glia optogenetically. They use uh, calcium waves as a signaling uh, 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 messenger. And we can use and adapt different optogenetic tools to create calcium waves and turn on the glia. Uh, we showed that actually back in 2009. Uh, but now there's been a, a flowering of different tools uh, that recruit different biochemical messengers uh, that uh, can be used for glia and even other cells that are not electrically excitable. And it's been applied to stem cells, been applied to, to many others as well. Uh, Matt Schultz from uh, Imisoft, a gene therapy company. Have you guys done any work uh, using the optical genetics to control uh, transcriptional activity, like to turn on a promoter and alter uh, something other than just the uh, firing of a neuron? Yeah, the question is that we used optogenetics to, to control transcription directly. Uh, we didn't, uh, but uh, uh, a graduate of the lab named Feng Zhang did that uh, in his lab at MIT. He developed a, a technology called a LITE, L-I-T-E, for optical control of transcription and also of epigenetic state of the state of the, uh, of the chromatin. So that is also possible now. I have one other question from social media that can be read in a generic way that I think is not intended, but here's the question. Are the patterns the same for every rat? <laughs> Are the patterns the same for every rat? Uh, well, uh, we can provide the same patterns, but they have different effects on different rats uh, for sure. Uh, uh, of course, there's a group averages, just like in human beings in big clinical trials, there are group averages, population shifts. And we, what we typically report is the population average. But very often, uh, as with any intervention in human medicine or in animal research, there are susceptible, resistant uh, animals that respond in different ways. And so certainly uh, understanding the basis for that of trait variability is uh, something that, that we're intrigued by. If you know what you're playing in, it's the same from animal to animal exactly, and they're getting a different response, then that opens an opportunity. You can dive in and see, OK, where? Within the pathway, do you start to see things uh, become different? And uh, uh, that's now uh, uh, actually an active area of research on a number of fronts. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Carl. All right. Thank you.